We'll call the Bucks County Commissioner's meeting of April 21st, 2021 to order. Beginning with the Pledge of Allegiance, and we would ask Audrey Kenny, our Director of Emergency Management, to lead us in that pledge. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the Good morning, everybody. And before we begin with any proclamations, I just want to let you know that we removed from the agenda, which, which was number two, the emergency management issue. That has been taken off the agenda and has also been removed from the agenda on the website. So having said that, beginning with proclamations, we'll start with Commissioner Harvey. Thank you. Um, so we have sort of a, obviously a theme which goes with the fact that tomorrow's Earth Day, uh, but also a, a nice little coincidence is the fact that we are, or rather the Bucks County Conservation District is celebrating its 60th anniversary. So we do have a proclamation and we have Gretchen Schatzneider here from the Conservation District. Uh, so uh, I'll read this aloud and then we'll have her come up and she can say a few words. Whereas the Pennsylvania General Assembly in 1945 enacted the Conservation District Law, providing for the conservation of soil across the Commonwealth through the creation of local conservation districts. And whereas the Bucks County Board of Commissioners, finding significant need to control soil erosion in the historically farm heavy county, established by resolution the Bucks County Conservation District on April 24, 1961. And whereas despite pushback and protest early in its existence, the Conservation District has persisted for 60 years and continues to promote the wise use of the county's land and the pre preservation of its soil and water. And whereas in the decades since its founding, the Conservation District has adapted to changes in land use spurred by expanding industrial, commercial, and residential development, all the while maintaining laser focus on its mandate. And whereas there could be no more appropriate time than Earth Day to acknowledge that Bucks County's natural beauty endures thanks in part to the continued efforts of the Bucks County Conservation District. Now, therefore, do we, the Bucks County Board of Commissioners, hereby recognize the Bucks County Conservation District on the occasion of its 60th anniversary. In doing so, we thank the Conservation District for its work and encourage all residents to support its mission of preserving and protecting the natural splendor of Bucks County so that it may continue to be treasured for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to invite Gretchen, do you want to, I don't know if you have anything to say, and then we can take a quick picture up here. Well, initially, I just want to say thank you to the commissioners for this lovely and detailed uh, recognition. I would also like to say thank you to the past commissioners who had the foresight to create the Bucks County Conservation District. And as you mentioned in that reading, it was originally designed, we were originally designed for an agricultural conservation technical assistance um, office. But over the years, the land use has changed so dramatically in Bucks County that we've grown and taken on the delegation agreement with the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection to regulate the Clean Streams Law. And we now oversee the environmental regulations for all of the active construction in Bucks County. We're a very small agency with a very big task. Um, our job is difficult at times, but it's with the support of the commissioners and the um, support of the public with, of the county that we are grateful to do this job for you. I'd just like to also mention that the Conservation District has programs that um, include improving water quality around roadways, dirt and gravel roadways, or low volume roadways. Um, we have programs like still for agricultural assistance, technical assistance, design, planning, implementation, of um, agricultural best management practices. We regularly achieve funding through grants to implement um, environmental benef beneficially environmental uh, projects throughout the county. Um, we have a big one coming up in the next year or so down in Core Creek at Lake Luxembourg um, with the county support. We're very thrilled to have achieved this goal. Um, and so please check in on our website, buckscd.org, learn more about the Conservation District and how we can help you in your community. And thank you again to the commissioners. I hope you have a wonderful day. Oh, thank thank you. you. Thank you. Do you want to come get your proclamation? And thank you, too, to you and your staff for answering some questions from some residents about that Lake Luxembourg issue the other day. It was good to have you out there. Absolutely. Anytime. 
So we'll put you right here. Next, we have from the Penn State Co-op, co Kathleen Connolly is going to be here to talk to us about the Adams Hollow Community Garden Project. But as she comes up here, I know everyone can't wait to hear what happened with the weed I told you I was going to send to her <laughs> last commissioner's meeting. So it's Bittercress, and I feel better just knowing what the name is, and they sent me terrific information that it is actually germinates in the fall. So it gets like hibernates, I guess, all winter, and then it emerges as soon as spring comes, so you're probably seeing it like I did. And apparently it will go away, although I'm not trusting them on this. When the grass overgrows it, then you won't see it anymore, but I did pull it, although I understand it has little stems and that's where the seeds are, so everybody beware of what that is, but I got an immediate response and I want to thank you for that. Oh, I'm so glad to so, hear And it's good to have you here today. Thank you. Thanks for having us back. Um, last time we were here to talk about our garden and watershed hotline and today we're here to talk about a project that we're doing in Bristol Borough at the Adams Hollow Community Garden and I have with me here Donna McCluskey who's in charge of that garden and Russ Hartman who is the chair of the committee that put together this project that we're going to see a video about right now our composting committee at that garden. Penn State Extension is a branch of Penn State University. Our mission is to extend university research in science and soil over the present and communities. Our mission, we believe all people should have access to science-based education. The Master Gardener Volunteer Program is a big part of Extension's outreach across Pennsylvania. Master Gardeners are volunteers successfully trained in horticulture and environmental stewardship by Penn State. They bring their knowledge and passion for gardening to the communities to help home gardeners learn good home gardening practices. In Bucks County, we have 200 trained master gardeners. Our newest class, the Master Gardener Class of 2021, is the first quote unquote virtual class, entirely trained from home during the pandemic. Their projects are focused exclusively in Lower Bucks County, home of Bucks County's largest and most diverse population. Here's a screenshot of the Master Gardener class of 2021 in their virtual learning environment. We are proud to say after six months of training and learning from home, all 31 students passed their final exam at the end of March. This is the location of the Bucks County Master Gardener class of 2021's primary project, providing educational support at the Adams Hollow Community Garden located on Jefferson Avenue in Bristol Borough. Adams Hollow Community Garden was established in 2015 when the Garden Club of Bristol Borough entered into an agreement with the Borough of Bristol and the Grundy Foundation to convert the county's abandoned tennis courts into a raised bed community garden. The Community Garden Committee recognized that many of its members would benefit from the educational support offered by the Penn State Master Gardeners of Watch County, and so a partnership was formed. Families in the Borough Garden at Adams Hollow enjoy time together planting, growing, harvesting, and learning. Note, this is a pre-coded slide. The gardens are beautiful and well-maintained, but every gardener can benefit with more research-based education about good gardening practices. Case in point, the composting process at Adams Hollow was not working well for a number of reasons. One reason is that it's difficult to create compost on tarmac. Another is that even though end-of-season garden plants hold weeds, grass clippings, tree leaves, and plant trimmings are good candidates for composting, they need to be broken down into smaller sizes so the organic materials can break down faster. The community gardeners weren't aware of the science of composting and could benefit from learning how to create and use compost in their garden beds. Composting turns garden trash into garden treasure. It's a process that allows naturally occurring microbes to convert yard waste, such as leaves and grass clippings and kitchen scraps, to a useful organic soil amendment or mulch. Incorporating compost into garden soil increases water holding capacity, 
aeration, and nutrient exchange in the soil. Finished compost should look much like a uniform potting soil with no indication of what materials originally went into the pile. The ideal ratio for composting can be achieved by combining the greens, such as kitchen scraps, to grass cuttings with the browns, such as dried tree leaves. Our Master Gardener class in 2021 set up a compost committee of seven members to help address the composting problems that have followed. Here, the committee members are assessing the composting issues on their first site visit last fall. The committee enlisted the help of a veteran Bucks County Master Gardener who specializes in helping Bucks County residents with composting issues. Her name is Donna Vanilla, and she's been a Master Gardener for 20 years Following Donna's recommendation, the committee searched for a supplier of free pallets to use to build a free bin composting system. Class member Darlene Holland, shown here supervising the loading of pallets, was able to source them by following a pallet truck down Route 13 in Bristol Township and asked the owner of the Johnson & Johnson Pallet Company for the donation. We are so proud of Darlene's resourcefulness. Donna helped the composting committee with the bin build over the winter. The three bin system built from this material is a recycling of resource that is easily obtainable and often disposed of. This is the finished product. It's a simple three bin system where one bin is filled with greens and browns, and then we move on to the next bin to start another compost pile. The process includes adding more browns than greens, keeping the pile slightly moist and turning to aerate. This accelerates the decomposition process. The three bin system will eventually allow for a continuous availability of usable compost. Note the tennis balls on the bars that hold the bins in place, a nod to the former tennis courts perhaps. Now, they were used because the edges were a bit sharp and we didn't want any injuries. However, the bins commanded a lot of interest and excitement from the community. One of the Adams Hollow community gardeners, Bill Dawes, was so excited that he volunteered to quote unquote buff the steel stakes holding the bins together to make them safe so the tennis balls could be removed. The community excitement extended to businesses in Bristol Borough, specifically the Calm Waters Coffee Roasters on Mill Street. They asked about contributing coffee grounds in the past, and now Adams Hollow was finally able to take them up on their offer. The excitement also extended to the Noble Earth Kombucha Shop on Mill Street. Adams Hollow could accept their offer of spent grains thanks to the new composting bins. Despite being brown in color, coffee grounds and kombucha grains are a source of nitrogen in the science of composting and are considered green material. With this new source of greens, the committee created a new grounds reserve bin, mostly for dry tree leaves to balance the ingredients. and voila, the finished reserve ground bins. The compost committee has also provided buckets to the gardeners at Adams Hollow so they can bring their own kitchen scraps and selected yard waste to the new bins. They'll be provided with free buckets and educational materials at the compost kickoff day scheduled for Saturday, May 27th at the Adams Hollow Community Garden. At the event, the compost committee will be on hand to unveil the instructional signage that will be hung above the compost bins. It will look something like this example. During the entire growing season, the compost committee and other committees will tell you about it. future needs, will supply additional educational support by making themselves available to the gardeners. A master gardener will be at the garden each Saturday during the growing season to help with composting or other questions. Here's Master Gardener Nick Cole helping out one of the community gardeners for the soil test. Also, Adams Hollow Community Gardeners will be provided with our garden hotline information where they can reach a Master Gardener on weekdays. Let's finish up with the value of this program to Bucks County. 
The composting committee will spend at least 570 volunteer hours helping to educate Adams Hollow gardeners about the science of composting. With an independent sector volunteer rate of $27.20 per hour, this translates to $15,504 in educational value to Mock County residents. With the Adams Hollow Community Gardeners bringing kitchen scraps and selected bird waste to the new bins, and the coffee and kombucha shops spent grounds and grains, this project provides a minimum $1,000 savings in waste removal costs for Bristol Borough and local taxpayers at 3.7 cents per pound. The master gardeners in Cox County Class of 2021 are hard at work in our box, and we'll share more of their projects with you in upcoming meetings. In the meantime, feel free to contact our Master Gardener Coordinator, Kathleen Connolly, with any questions you have. Thank you so much for your time today. We genuinely appreciate this opportunity to share our work with you and look forward to coming back. Thank you, that's great. Thanks to the, the class actually put that video together, so and narration and everything. So great job to them. And uh, Donna and Russ can answer any questions that you have. Okay, I asked questions last time. Anybody else have any questions? Go ahead, Gene. <laughs> not, not so much a question, but just uh, it brings back a lot of memories for me when you talk about composting. And because we had a, a, grew up on a farm, our family farm in Ben Salem. And uh, I can remember, because my dad had the main responsibility, and I'm talking going back 50, 60 years, that uh, during the winter, he would take the, the farm truck and go up to some of the large uh, uh, places that raise chickens in the upper part of the county, and he would stay up there all day and shovel chicken manure into the truck and bring it back to the farm in Ben Salem. And then if he had time that day or the next morning, I mean, if I, I, I remember as a little boy, I just can't imagine anybody doing that today. He would shovel the chicken manure out of the truck onto a farm trailer with a tractor and then take the tractor and the trailer out in the fields and for the third time shovel the chicken manure again out, out into the fields. And this would be like a, almost a daily or other day occurrence of him taking the chicken manure. Um, and, and back then, you know, they were just trying to save some money on fertilizer and, you know, trying to enrich the soil there because we grew vegetables, which you had up on the screen, which is good for compost. But I remember my dad doing that for a number of years when I was a little boy. I wanted to help out, but I was a little bit too young back then to try to help out. But that was really, really hard work, it really was. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, yeah, I'll ask uh, a question here. So, and I guess it depends on you know, Russ or Donna, who wants to answer it? So for people who are just starting as gardeners, what are some of the common mistakes that the rookies make? I can speak from personal experience with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, because although I have the master gardener uh, pin on me, I graduated ten, uh, in the class of 2010. Uh, it took me a while to get my home composting going. Um, as many of you may know, that a lot of homes in Bristol Borough, we have very small backyards. My backyard is a little postage stamp. Um, so I did um, create a small bin, and I would go out and I would put my kitchen scraps in, and I would just add some dirt onto it, which is considered a black. So I just would turn it in. And it eventually would break down, but it never really cooked the way you really want a compost uh, pile to cook. And so I have to say that I learned so much just with this class of 2021 coming to Adams Hollow because those leaves, those browns, are so important. Um, they started this uh, bin back last fall. And so, you know, it was frozen for most of the winter, and they really just have started working it. And uh, I was so delighted last week when I went over and I got the pitchfork and I just started turning it. I wanted to see what was happening and the steam and the smoke was coming up out of it. So they really have it going. So even if you have a small container at home that you're doing this and you can do it on a very small scale, but the leaves are very important. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. And we thank you for your time and for everything you're doing. It's great. 
<laughs> thank you, and thank you for being here. I'm sure we'll see you again. Thank you. Okay, take care. Um, next, we'll begin with Commissioner Deidre Alamo, who's going to read the proclamation, and then our um, Red Robin Robinson will be joining us. But Commissioner Deidre Alamo, and this is for the Gift of Life yeah. organ donation. Thank you. Uh, I have a proclamation from the commissioners. Uh, whereas in the United States, one person every nine minutes joins to more than 100,000 already desperately awaiting life-saving organs on a national transport waiting list. Many in America, unfortunately, are never paired with the organs they need, and 17 lives are lost every day as a result. A single organ donor can save the lives of the eight people and a tissue donor can improve life for more than 75. Whereas more than 39,000 organ transplant procedures were performed in the year 2020, setting an annual record for the 10th year in a row. And whereas April is recognized across the country as National Donate Life Month in celebration of those selfless acts of generosity, that save thousands each year while enriching the lives of innumerable others. Whereas Gift of Life, a nonprofit serving Eastern Pennsylvania, Southern New Jersey, and Delaware, has coordinated more than 47,000 organ transplants since 1974, as well as one million tissue transplants, and in the last 11 years, has coordinated the most organ transplant of any similar organization in the United States. Now, therefore, we, we the Board of the County Commissioners, Chair Diane ellis Morseglia, Vice Chair Robert Harvey, and Jean DiGirolamo, hereby thank the Gift of Life donor program for its tireless efforts to improve, extend, and preserve life for thousands. In so doing, we encourage all residents to support its goal of extending and enhancing life for those for our region and beyond, as well as to consider making the individual choice to become an organ donor. Uh, congratulations, and I'd like to invite Robin up to the podium for some And as comments. she walks out, I'd just like to add, Robin, that I'm sorry, but also very proud to have watched your commitment to this over, over the years. Um, it wasn't a great thing for you to begin, but you have been an advocate like none other. Diane, now you're going to make me cry. Well, that's why and, I did that. And <laughs> I said to Emma today, my daughter, I am not going to cry through this because every time I go out and speak for Gift of Life, I end up crying. And usually I have Emma there to say, okay, Emma, you take over. But I just want to thank you all so much. This means so much to me personally because of my husband and because of my stepbrother, Danny, who gave his kidney to um, a father of five who was able to live a normal life. So my story with organ donation started back in 1986 when I got married. And when Mark and I went to the Motor Vehicle Department to change our driver's license, because we had moved, the fellow asked us, do you want to be an organ donor? And Mark said, yes, what am I going to do with those organs when I'm dead? So fast forward to October 2010 in Doylestown Hospital when the nurse asked me, your husband has organ donor on his license. Does he want to be an organ donor? Do you want to do that? And I said, yes. So not only is it important to put organ donor on your driver's license, but you need to tell your loved ones because they will ask you if this is what you want to do. Because my husband lost a lot of oxygen in his heart attack, he was a tissue donor. So we donated his bones, his skin, his membranes, and his eyes. And like Jean said, he helped enhance the life of 75 people in our area. Fast forward, and I wasn't going to talk about that, but I do want to tell all of you that I am a, um, a recipient. So five years after my husband died, and Diane experienced this with me, I received um, bone grafts. and. You know, without the help of donors, I wouldn't be here. I would be here today, but I wouldn't be smiling like I am. <laughs> so um, I want to thank all of you for being donors, because I hope that you all are. And remember, um, being an organ donor is being a hero. Thank, thank you. you. Do you want to come up and we'll give you the confirmation? Thank you. 
Yes, yeah, stand right here and we'll take a quick picture of it. I'm smiling. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to any brief public comments. This will be for items that are actually on our agenda. Um, is there any online public comments on agenda items? Uh, yes, Commissioner. Um, we actually received um, uh, a number of uh, online comments, excuse me, um, that appear to relate to items that are not on the agenda. Um, I think that's because the agenda was updated. Um, so just so the commissioners are aware, um, we've written back to everyone who um, wrote concerning an item that was pulled earlier and asked if they wanted to resubmit something for the end. Um, either way, we can forward those comments okay. to the commissioners. Um, and if anything comes in at the end, we can read them during all items. Um, we also, commissioners, have an email comment um, from Andy Warren uh, of Langhorn. Um, Commissioner Warren's email also appears to refer to an old agenda, um, and we asked for clarification. We haven't received it, so uh, I would suggest that we um, read the question that appears to, to correlate to uh, an item on the consent agenda. Okay. And uh, that question concerns what is now item 4A, um, which is uh, whether this item, which is from the law department, approving a fee agreement to provide outside counsel to joint representation of Bucks and other public entities as interveners in environmental lit litigation with Hangley Aronchek. Um, if this um, complies with the quote, maximum hourly rate for outside counsel litigation adopted at the commissioner's meeting, January 22nd, 2020, $350 per hour. Would you like me to answer that question? Sure. Okay. Um, so commissioner, this is actually a, a great question because uh, it gives an opportunity to explain um, the change um, in approach by this administration. Um, the firm here in question is actually a firm that um, the prior administration had engaged with the county um, at a rate of $400 an hour, um, and 100% of that was paid for by the county. Um, so when the commissioners decided to provide a, a new approach um, to um, publicly identifying the law firms that it wanted the county solicitor to regularly engage and to set maximum rates um, for different kinds of matters, which have been updated over the course over the, over the last 15 months, um, they have done that through public votes. And then when there have been unusual um, matters um, that required a separate vote um, or potentially required a separate vote, the commissioners have um, submitted those for the agenda. So with this firm, um, which again in the last administration had been paid $400 an hour, um, fully funded by the county, um, we began to explore a different model, um, specifically when we had matters that impacted not only Bucks County, but other public entities. Um, we had a number of litigations last year um, where Bucks County, along with other counties, um, were uh, brought into election litigation. And so we found ways um, to actually get the high quality representation um, at lower rates, um, not only by convincing the firm to bring their maximum rate a little, little bit down uh, for 400, but by getting them to agree to allow us to share that bill with other, um, other counties or other public entities. Um, and I'll speak to the content of this, if that's right, during the solicitor report. Um, but uh, this is one of several cases where um, the county is, is splitting the bill um, at least three ways. Um, so this item actually provides the commissioners a chance to, to vote um, to, to um, approve this particular engagement. But the actual uh, cost of the county, uh, where the rate that the firm is getting paid at $385 an hour plus expenses, um, is actually less than $130 an hour because the, um, the resolution here says that the county's share will be no more than a third. Uh, and of course, if additional um, counties or public entities choose to join this representation, that share will only go down. Um, so, so overall, the answer is yes. Um, the county's share is actually significantly less um, than what our normal uh, litigation rate would be and certainly our, our maximum rate. Um, but the, the commissioners, uh, as well as our department, think it's prudent uh, to put this item on the agenda. Terrific. Thank you very much. Is there any other public comment on, online on the? No, Commissioner. Okay. Is there any public comment in the audience for agenda items?
everybody. Good morning. I did try to get your attention during the last proclamation. I was waving my hand. We need one of those bus pull thing uh, <laughs> things. But uh, I wanted to uh, to speak about organ donation just for a second. Sure. So I'm sorry to go backwards. It's not usually my style. I don't know if Robin's still here or not. Uh, but Robin gets a lot of credit. That is a, a, an incredible organization. And she's obviously, she's living the mission of it. But I, I think it's important for people to also understand that we, uh, in my field, we, we are uh, confronted with this issue pretty regularly. Unfortunately, it's in our most serious and dire cases, which are our homicide cases. And uh, a light bulb went off in my head one time when I was asked. It was a case I was prosecuting, and it's, unfortunately, this, this poor little, little kid was going to succumb to her injuries. and. Um, the gift of life approached me and asked me if it would be it would be okay. Um, would it compromise the prosecution? And I talked with the doctor, Dr. Hood, who's our pathologist. Dr. Hood is nothing if not pragmatic, and he said, you know what, it might, but Imagine this, Dr. Hood's on the stand and I'm asking him questions and say, did we agree to give the gift of life? The answer is yes, and did that affect your opinion in this autopsy? And he would say, absolutely not. Um, and we were able to help and benefit so many other lives. And that was the light bulb moment for me. And the, the point that I would like to make is that we are human beings first. And then we have whatever individual roles we play in government to make sure that our communities are better. But we can never forget our humanity. That is just, uh, is just an incredible organization. And our, uh, our philosophy unequivocally, without exception, is we always agree to acquiesce to the gift of life, whether it would affect our criminal prosecution or not. So uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to just say a couple of words. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for sharing that. That was really important, and, and I really uh, am grateful for you sharing it. Is there any other public comment? Seeing, okay, seeing none, uh, is there a motion to approve items 1 through 8A on the consent agenda? And that would include the minutes also of the April 7th, 2021 meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Moving on to the regular agenda, first thing is 9A. This is approving a memoranda of understanding with the Clerk of Courts, Controller, Coroner, District Attorney, Prothonotary, Recorder of Deeds, Register of Wills, and the Treasurer regarding, regarding the anti-harassment and anti-retaliation policies. My colleagues may want to speak, but I just wanted to start by saying, you know, we refer a lot to our transition team and recommendations the transition team made to us when we took office. And part of the, that was to create a more diverse, more welcoming environment here, but we have taken that and gone a step further. In effort, an effort to make this a truly good working environment for the county, we have hired a diversity officer. We took on a new project last year, making sure that all of our employees participated in a diversity and racial awareness program with Walking While Black, joining the district attorney and the program he brought to many townships. Um, we are continuing to, to provide diversity training and we are going to start a leadership training for our employees to make sure that we are creating a truly kind and, and valuable work environment. On a very personal level, I believe that people come to work every day wanting to work. Nobody gets up and says, let me go to my job and do a bad job. Everybody gets up and they want to feel good. They have to spend a long time at that job and they want to go home and believe that they did a good job. They don't want to feel shamed, they don't want to feel bullied, they don't want to feel harassed, they don't want to worry about retaliation. So I am thrilled that eight of our row officers have joined the three of us in signing this anti-harassment, anti-retaliation pledge. And this is uh, Sexual Harassment Awareness Month, so no better month for us to, to announce this and um, thank everyone for being a part of it. Commissioner Harvey? No, no, I can't, honestly can't say anything better than what you just said, Madam Chair. Same here. Mr. DiTrollo. All right. So, I think, do you want to do that separately or because it's its own? I guess for a moment, the row officers, if you want to stand for just a second, and uh, thank you very much for taking that pledge. Here. Sure. Okay. Okay, so they're not standing up, but that's okay. They're thrilled they took it. 
That was an order. <laughs> what was a beg? How's that one? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, the next is from our health department with AMI Ex Expeditionary Healthcare LLC out of Reston, Virginia, approving a contract increase and extension to provide public COVID-19 vaccination services in the amount of $12,548,738. Commissioner, I mean, uh, Commissioners, uh, Audrey Kenny is here on behalf of the health department to talk about this contract. Thank you. These are going really well with the uh, vaccination clinics. We have five now. Uh, we just were able to open up the Warwick site this week, which is being run by the health department. But we still have our four clinics running um, that AMI has been managing. We just crossed over 85,000 vaccinations at those clinics um, yesterday. So we're super excited about that. We do have some work to do. We have um, plans through the end of July right now to uh, to continue with our vaccination efforts. We do need to vacate from the three community colleges at that time. So we're looking for an alternate site in the lower end of the county um, to provide support and services uh, to, to that population. That's where our largest population base is. But the, the clinics have been very well received from the community. We've had a lot of really positive feedback from the services AMI has been providing. And some of the stumbles with the software program, we continue to work through those. The IT department has been tremendous. John Rigol has just been a great partner, as has Margie, trying to, to navigate through some of those waters. But we're able to continue um, vaccinating our community and making sure we get to the other side of this as soon as we can. And we are thrilled with that, too. Is there comments on the vaccination? Or the uh, just, um, I'll just kind of piggyback. First off, thanking Ms. Kenny for all the work that she's been doing uh, in her office, as well as our health department, really coordinating all of this. Um, just to, you know, based, we get numbers every day about vaccinations in Bucks County, and not just the ones that we do, but ones that are done at pharmacies and hospitals and private practices, et cetera. Uh, so as of this morning, about 46% of adults in Bucks County have received at least one dose. About 28% of adults in Bucks County have, are fully vaccinated. Uh, so I'm anticipating us being over 50% at least one dose by the end of this week. I know we were looking at possibly a record number of vaccinations uh, issued this week. Uh, and so that's obviously something we're looking forward to. We're waiting still on some guidance with Johnson Johnson. We're hoping that that comes through, um, you know, this, I think Friday, there's supposed to be a meeting, I think by the, the federal government, um, in which case the Warwick site will open up, you know, full steam ahead the way it was sort of intended to. But, um, but no, the, you know, I've been visiting the sites pretty regularly. Uh, the, the staff there, the AMI personnel themselves, the people they've hired really do a wonderful job. Uh, we get really nothing but compliments about the professionalism and how friendly everybody is and how smoothly it worked. And I think at the Warwick site yesterday where we're doing Pfizer, um, I think our health department staff kept uh, a record. And I think they were disappointed at the one time period because it took, I think it was like 23 minutes. <laughs> From, from the time somebody walked in the, the, the room, the building, to the time they had left, it was about 23 minutes. Right. And they were disappointed in that because it was a minute or two slower than other times during the day. And they were anxious. And keep in mind, you're waiting 15 minutes after you get your shot. <laughs> so the amount of time you sign in, you get checked in, you get your shot, and then checking out afterwards. Uh, we're talking about a, a process that's less than, less than a sitcom long, uh, you know, uh, so, um, but, but um, you know, that's the kind of people they are. They're, they're pushing for that kind of perfection. So we appreciate that, and, and thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Just the same thing, Audrey. Thank you very much. I mean, you know, what, a, what, what a challenge this has been for all of us, and, uh, and I, I just don't know how you do it, but you and your staff and everybody that's involved in this has really done nothing short of a remarkable job here in Bucks County. Thanks. And and getting this vaccine out to people. So I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, and thank you on behalf of all the the residents of Bucks County for the great job you've been doing. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And we encourage the public to keep Audrey and her staff busy by getting <laughs> out much. there and getting a vaccine. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> thank you. And they you. can register on our website directly for any appointments. I think we have about a hundred thousand appointments available through June. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is for, with the Tax Claim Bureau and Rudolph Clark, LLC, Trevos, Trevos, Pennsylvania, approving the appointment of outside counsel as the Tax Claim Bureau solicitor at a rate of $150 an hour in expenses, to not to exceed $25,000 a year. And um, 
I'm thinking the solicitor, did you want to speak to this? Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, this, again, is part of that same um, theme of the county um, moving away from earlier practices um, for what we think are better practices. Um, part of that has been um, moving away from the use of a lot of part-time lawyers that are county employees that have um, benefits as county employees um, but are not um, focusing all of their time on, on county work and recognizing at the same time that there is a, a great use for using outside counsel for certain things. And um, fortunately, um, the commissioners have identified a way to continue to keep some of the great talent that we have working in the county, but to move us forward um, to the place that the transition team recommended and that the, the commissioners want to go. This item, uh, for example, would um, take one of those part-time solicitors um, who currently is our tax claim bureau solicitor, um, that's work being done by the law firm of Rudolph Clerk. Um, and um, I, I think the, the intention would be for um, the attorney, uh, Michael Clark, um, to be removed from county employment and instead um, to be tracking the time that is being spent on Tax Claim Bureau work at a rate of $150 a year, uh, ensuring that over the course of a year, no more than that amount that the commissioner said um, 25000 would be spent. Uh, even if that maximum was reached, that number alone is significantly less than what the county um, uh, needs to invest in each employee in terms of benefits and, and pension or retirement fund obligations and so forth. Um, so I, I, um, I, I, I don't want to speak for the commissioners, but I believe that the intention would be um, that this would not be the last um, uh, resolution of its kind, but, but in fact, as um, some of the existing um, solicitors uh, over time uh, retire or, or move on, and new solicitors for uh, row officers or places like the Tax Claim Bureau are brought on, that this kind of model um, would, would better serve the county, to, and again, making sure that we continue to have uh, top-notch legal representation. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the No, not at this time. Okay. All right, thank you. Is there a motion to approve um, items 9 through 11? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And we have some budget adjustments today. Mr. Pascola. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, for your consideration today, adjustment number eight um, would recognize um, the revenue and expense for two pass-through grants. Um, one, a redevelopment assistance capital program grant for Doylestown Hospital Center for Heart and Vascular Care, $1 million, and a Commonwealth uh, Office of Commonwealth Libraries Keystone Grant um, for the Bucks County Free Library Levittown branch, um, $83,600. Um, no impact on the general fund. It's just passed through grants to those two organizations. Thank you. Is there questions? Is there a motion to approve the two budget or the one budget adjustment? So moved. Is there a okay. second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Is there a motion to um, approve the personnel actions for today? So moved. Second. Any questions for anybody? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And are there any board appointments today, Mr. Commissioner yes, Harvey? We have a couple uh, for our local emergency planning committee. Uh, two new appointments. Uh, Audrey Kenny is uh, interim head of emergency management, uh, will be on the emergency planning committee. That seems appropriate. Uh, James O'Malley, who is part of public information, uh, apparently doesn't have enough to do, so we're putting him on that committee as well. <laughs> Uh, those appointments, uh, Ms. Kenny's would go till um, January 1st, 2022, Mr. O'Malley's January 1st, 2023, and then two reappointments, George Wilson uh, and Stephen Stasola, both go to uh, January 1st, 2023. That's for Emergency Planning Committee. And then one new appointment to the Mental Health Development of Programs Advisory Board. Um, uh, Dr. Miriam Mahmoud uh, is, would be appointed uh, to May 1st, 2024. It's a three-year term. Thank you. It, second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Any other civics for today? Anybody? I have, I have a few of them just to catch us up. Let's see. The, the first one is 20, our annual $2,400 contribution to the Bowman Hill Wildflower Preserve. The second is our annual contribution of $1,500 to the Christmas Gala, which is not just about Christmas, so that's why it's still at this time of year, and our annual $2,400 contribution to the Twilight Wish Foundation. And I have a th 
and one more we would, I thought this was on there, but we may not have done this for a while, but to the Quakertown Community Day, I wanted to ask if we could give them a contribution of $1,000. So I can make those in the form of a motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Terrific. Um, solicitor's report. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so getting back to this item that was on the consent agenda, I'm happy to share an update during Earth Week about um, our efforts to continue to protect the environment here in Bucks County. Um, many folks know that Bucks is uh, within the Delaware River Basin, which is a watershed that um, uh, spans four states, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and New York, and that the governments of those states many years ago had formed uh, an agreement with Congress um, to establish a Delaware River Basin Commission that set certain rules and among the rules and practices that were put in place, um, going back about 10 years, a um, little more than that, um, was originally a moratorium and then a complete ban on fracking in the basin. Um, and the reason for that was because of the significant environmental harms that were identified um, and that, that would put places in the, in the, in the basin, um, like the county, at risk. Um, and we could go through a long uh, list of, 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 of things that we enjoy here in Bucks County that could be compromised um, if fracking were, were to occur. Uh, a couple months back, um, there was an effort to try and challenge this, um, this prohibition um, led by um, the Republican caucus and the Senate. And um, that effort um, was joined about three weeks ago by uh, two counties, um, not in the southeast, um, a Carbon and Wayne counties. And um, the, um, the, the, the commissioners then saw an opportunity um, to, to heed what is spelled out in the Pennsylvania Constitution. Um, we have an environmental rights amendment um, which recognizes that all citizens of the Commonwealth have an inviolable right to pure water, and the Commonwealth and its municipalities have an obligation to conserve and maintain that resource. Um, there were no counties on the other side of this issue advocating um, to, um, to throw this lawsuit out to maintain the ban. The ban. And um, unfortunately, through the, um, the leadership in this administration, um, we were able to move very quickly um, to uh, ask for a seat at the table. Um, and this is where it, it was very helpful th um, to have good relationships with our neighbors in Montgomery County. Um, it turned out that the, um, a, a Senate delegation led by Sen uh, Senator Sanicero uh, here in Bucks County um, had already engaged the Hangley firm, which we have um, a very good working relationship with, to help us with this effort. And last week, um, we filed a motion along with Montgomery County seeking to intervene in this uh, litigation. Uh, and, and I'm happy to report late yesterday, uh, the federal judge assigned to this matter granted our motion. And so now Bucks County, along with Montgomery, Montgomery County, has joined this fight. Um, we expect to be filing our own motion to dismiss this complaint and to continue to stand up for the right of, of all citizens in the Commonwealth, especially in Bucks County, to enjoy um, pure water uh, and to protect our environment. Thank you. And moving to the Chief Operating Officer's report. Thank you, Commissioner. I just have a, a couple of, of items. Uh, first, related to our COVID response, the Bucks County Rental and Utility Assistance Program is funded by the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, our Housing and Community Development Office is working with our nonprofit partners on this program. The application process is still open. Uh, the CDC eviction moratorium was extended to June 30th, uh, 2021. Funds can be applied to past due rent utilities and future down payments. Um, and it's available for up to 12 months of assistance. There's no financial limit on, the, on what a household can receive. Um, right now, we've received about 2,000 tenant, we, we're working on 2,000 tenant cases with about 662 landlords. They've applied since, that's how many have applied since March. Um, applicants must demonstrate housing instability under the guidelines and uh, you can complete your application online, over the phone, or via email, or in person. We're encouraging la all landlords in the county to work with their renters to apply, um, and on the prompt is a slide from the housing link with contact information as well as the website to go to, and it is the housing link's website, um, and we really, really, want to emphasize that there is um, a significant amount of funding available through this program, 
um, that, that we would like to get out the door to those who need it most. And then the la last thing I want to mention is that today is Administrative Assistance Day. Um, I want to thank all of our administrative staff in the county. It's a great pleasure to work with all of you. And we certainly appreciate everything you do every day. Um, uh, a special thank you to, to my coworkers in our department, Liz Gates and Anna Payne, Stephen Seifert and Marcy, Marcy Pankowski. I, I can't thank you enough for everything that you do for all of us every day. You put up with me, so that's, that's uh, that goes without saying. Um, and then at this point, commissioners, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yield the rest of my time to Gail Humphrey, our chief clerk and division leader for the Board of Elections to talk about the upcoming primary election, which is on Tuesday, May 18th. Thanks, Gail. Thank you, Margie. Um, first, commissioners, I um, want to talk a little bit about a video we're gonna share with you. You may remember a few commissioner meetings ago, the Wood School came and gave a presentation um, along with Tom Freitag our director of the Board of Elections. And um, the purpose of this video is a couple fold. Um, the first was we got brand new voting equipment soon after um, this administration came um, into control and then the COVID hit. And um, we've done a lot of poll worker training, but we always felt that this ADA compliant machine needed a little more intense training. So thankfully with the Wood School, we were able to put together this video and Jim O'Malley, our internal expert on making videos helped us um, and you'll see Tom Freitag in it. I can give you more information afterwards about the upcoming election, but I thought you might wanna watch this video first. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tom Freitag, director of the Bucks County Board of Elections. If someone's name is in the poll book and they're registered to vote, they are permitted to vote. Simply put, there is no competency requirement in Pennsylvania. If they are in the poll book, they are permitted to vote. Voters are permitted to have assistance either by someone that they bring or by a poll worker. In order to get assistance for the first time, they'll need to fill out the declaration of assistance. This is available to fill out at the polls. If they've already filled this out in the past, it will be designated in the poll book next to their name with an OT. Be sure that all voters who receive assistance are recorded on the record of assisted voters. In addition to the ClearCast ballot scanner, the Clear Access voting machine must be set up at every polling place. The Clear Access machine is an ADA accessible device that can be used by voters at the polling place. It's a touch screen that also comes equipped with a keypad that can be also equipped with a sip and puff for assistance. Poll workers will need to familiarize themselves with the Clear Access voting machine. Videos on its setup and use can be found on the Bucks County Board of Elections website under the Election Officials tab. Hi, I'm Samantha McKenna, an occupational therapist at Wood Services. When somebody comes to the polls, please direct all your communication to them. If they come with an aid, continue to direct all of your communication to the voter themselves. Some common things you'll see people bring to the polls are styluses to access touch screens, memory aids in order to recall who they've researched to vote for, and also an assistive device for communication. It could be low tech and it could be a piece of paper that they can indicate their choices or it could be an iPad that has a program on it. If somebody's bringing an assistive device to communicate, please allow ample time for them to respond to questions that you pose, for them to create their responses on their own, and do not rush the conversation. My name is Jeff Sedia. Some people may come to the polls and they have memory challenges. They are allowed to bring paper in with them to the polls or have their ballot written out on their phone in order to remember who they've researched to vote for. Some individuals might come to the poll and have motor coordination or motor planning deficits that they require the assistance of an aid for. This could be in the form of ataxia where their hands are shaking. They may need the assistance of an aid in order to steady their hand in the form of hand over hand assistance. While it may look like the aide is voting for them or directing them who to vote for, in fact, the person is in control. They just require some assistance to study in order to make the mark clear. While polling locations can be tight spaces, please take a look at the flow of the room. Allow 36 inches for aisleways and in between chairs and tables as you're able to. Walkways should be clear of low-lying obstacles and any bumps or divots in the surface should be rectified prior to the opening of the polls. You have been equipped 
to create a comfortable and accessible environment for all voters. If you have any questions, please reach out to the Board of Elections. Some disabilities are visible, some disabilities are invisible, and some disabilities are visible, but they don't need help. Remember, when in doubt, please just be kind and address the voters themselves. We'd like to thank the Wood Services for allowing us to shoot this video today. Thank you, Commissioners. And then I will add, um, we are conducting poll worker training, again, um, for this election, and we're offering three different types of poll worker training. The first training is in person, and we have um, three locations throughout the county. The first session is on Saturday, May 1st from 11 to 1. It'll be at the Fuge in Warminster. The second training is Sunday, May 2nd from 10 to 12 at Franconia Heritage Banquet and Conference Center, which is in Telford. The third is Sunday, May 2nd from 1 to 3, again at Franconia Heritage Banquet Hall. Um, that's the same day, but two sessions, um, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And then again on Saturday, May 8th from 10 to 12 at Maple Point Middle School in Lower Bucks, again on Saturday, May 8th from 1 to 3. The Board of Election staff asks that any poll worker that would like to do this training, please sign up ahead of time. Um, this is not um, training for the general public. It is very intense, specific training for poll workers. Um, because we are still um, going through COVID, we have two other options for our poll worker trainings. Another is an online training that we're finding a good number of our poll workers are currently taking advantage of. Um, it's technology that we were um, provided by County Commissioners Association. And it has um, something called co-fencing, and it's it's fantastic, actually. It allows our poll worker to lo log in, take the training, and then answer a few questions at the end. Um, so we know that they, did, they um, completed the training, which then allows us to pay them for their poll worker training. We pay poll workers $10 if they actually do come and actually work the poll after they receive their poll worker training. The last option we're offering is a CD. So if anyone feels that... Um, you know, maybe they don't have the transportation on one of these days. They can call the Board of Elections. We've burned CDs and we'll send our poll workers a CD to watch in the comfort of their home. Um, a few other things um, I can touch on um, in this primary. I know Commissioner Harvey had mentioned to me that it was something he wanted us to talk about. Um, in the primary, there are going to be referendums on our ballot. Um, there are some constitutional questions from the state and Normally, usually, in, in a primary, we only have um, you know the major parties voting, the Republicans and the Democrats. But um, independent voters can absolutely and have the right to come and vote during this primary election on May 18th to vote on those referendums, and, and we welcome them and encourage them to do so. Um, our mail and ballots are, are going well. Um, they should be out in the mail the latest next week. Um, we are doing internal testing right now on our high-speed scanners and the um, polling location scanners, is, um, that is going fine. Um, we are going to put our ballot boxes out again um, and have our on-demand voting centers up and operational beginning May 3rd. Um, the on-demand voting centers, I think, are a great tool um, and very useful. They are in Levittown, Doylestown, and Quakertown. And what we mean by on-demand is if you have filled out your um, mail-in ballot application would be step one. Um, step two is you can go to one of those three locations. They will print a ballot for you there. They will give you the um, envelope with the declaration on it and then you can deposit it in a ballot box. And the um, locations in our ballot boxes are published on our website. Thank you, and thank you for bringing the video back as promised and certainly kindness to all voters is the operating word there. And give it to thank Commissioner you. Harvey for Commissioner Comments. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank um, Mr. Freitag, Mr. O'Malley, Ms. Humphrey for the, for the video. Uh, we certainly want everybody to have the chance to vote uh, and be treated you know, respectfully when they do so. And just to, to piggyback just on one thing, um, that uh, a couple things Ms. Humphrey talked about. When, if, for independents who do go to vote uh, in May, um, the ballot you'll get will just simply be a ballot that has the four questions on it. You know, because that's obviously the primary is for people in each party to decide you know, which candidates they want to support within their party. If you're independent, you know, obviously you're not necessarily part of that 
uh, that activity, but you can vote on the questions. Uh, and so you'll just get about with those four questions. And that's the same if you've applied for mail-in ballot and you're an independent, the ballot you get in the mail will be uh, a ballot that just has those four questions. And for the on-demand, I know back in November, the problem we had or problem we saw was a lot of miscommunication among people. Um, we think there were some third parties that were calling it early voting. Uh, and so we had people showing up at the three offices here in Lovettown and Quakertown expecting to actually be able to vote, you know, and put it through the machine like you would on election day. You know, early voting does exist in some states. It does not exist here. <laughs> so really what you're doing with on demand is you're, you're basically getting a mail-in ballot, but you're getting it in person as opposed to, you know, filling out the application and mailing it to the Board of Elections or doing it online and then waiting for the ballot to come to you in the mail. Uh, so the, it's, uh, you know, just so people know, we've, I talked to some people who were in line and said, well, I know there's machines in there. I want to go vote on the machines back in November or in, in October. And it's, we had to tell them that's not, you know, that's not what this is. And because it was new, they usually didn't believe me. So they <laughs> stayed in line, which is fine. Uh, you know, but just so I think people are getting more used to it now. Um, and so I do thank the, um, thank everybody for all the efforts they're putting into that. Um, and in terms of other, you know, commissioner comments, um, you know, we did a lot of things today, obviously, with uh, focused on Earth Day, uh, between the Master Gardeners and the Conservation District. Earth Day is tomorrow, and, and I'm, I'm very, very proud of the fact, and I know Commissioner DiGiolamo has said this multiple times, you know, the environment is, is not a, should not be a partisan issue. Uh, you know, the three of us really up here are, are very much, you know, interested in doing whatever we can to protect the environment, and I'm proud of what we've done really just in the past uh, 15 months or so. Uh, just to kind of touch on some of them, uh, our solicitor mentioned the fact that we have joined um, a, a lawsuit with some state senators as well as Montgomery County to make sure that the Delaware River Basin Commission's ban on fracking stays put. Uh, clearly being downriver from uh, the areas of Pennsylvania where fracking would happen, uh, if it were allowed in our basin, our watershed, it certainly would have an impact on us. So we're, we're, we're excited to take on that fight. Um, we are also continuing our discussions with our neighboring counties about a power purchase agreement. Uh, and at some point we're looking at, uh, look at a memorandum of understanding between the counties to um, retain the services of uh, a professional who can give us some advice about our counties, Monco, Delco, Chester County, working together to attract a large scale uh, solar energy facility to this part of the state. Uh, which would feed energy to uh, the counties itself, uh, or it was some other options that there might be for the counties to start moving off of fossil fuels and start relying more on renewable energy. Uh, those are all part, of course, of the Ready for 100 initiative, the Sierra Club's Ready for 100, which this county adopted uh, just a few months ago. Uh, we're one of the only counties to do so in the Commonwealth. Uh, we've already had one meeting of a Ready for 100 committee where we discussed options and ideas uh, and raising some questions about how we move forward as a county to making ourselves more energy efficient. Uh, some of that you saw today, uh, which are on our agenda. One of the things early on um, was the purchase of a hybrid vehicle for our Department of Corrections. Uh, the Department of Corrections has also purchased the first two electric vehicles the county's ever owned. Uh, they'll be going into service very, very soon. Um, I think there was a video posted around somewhere that, that uh, talks about those. Um, the county's also put forward a model and alternative energy ordinance, which I've talked about before, thanks to our planning commission. The idea behind that model ordinance is for all 54 municipalities, it is a model they can use to adopt into their own zoning code or modify their zoning code, uh, which would clarify and in, and in some cases incentivize the use of solar panels, small scale wind, geothermal for residential and commercial property owners throughout the county. One of the challenges Pennsylvania faces uh, when it comes to catching up to some of our neighbors is that there is no statewide uh, zoning ordinance or zoning code, there's no statewide agreement on how to put solar panels on a home or any kind of property or uh, you know, businesses. Uh, there's, which means that of course all 67 counties have different rules and within all 67 counties, every single municipality has different rules. And if you're a developer, or you're a company that likes to you know, install solar panels or work with geothermal, uh, it's a little bit of a, of a research game to figure out, well, you know, this customer is in this township and their rules are different than 
the people who live across the street who are a different township, uh, which is different than the county next door, uh, and it becomes a little bit more of a challenge. And that's true for developers who want to come in and build residential and commercial developments. So we're hoping that communities across Bucks County can look at this ordinance and adopt something that's very uniform, which would make it easier, we feel, for developers and property owners uh, in our county uh, to move forward on these kinds of initiatives. Uh, we're also working with the Treasurer's Office on a CPACE program. We're going to have a meeting soon on that uh, to allow commercial property owners to get low interest loans stretched out over a long period of time if they want to retrofit their buildings uh, in terms of water conservation or energy. Uh, the, the county commissioners took a stand last year uh, opposing the uh, opening and the operations at the East Rock Hill Quarry where there's been found uh, some naturally occurring asbestos. Uh, so we're continuing to monitor that situation as DEP is doing its work. Um, we're working with a company called Protogen, uh, which is looking at county properties currently uh, to see how feasible it would be for the county to have its own solar energy facility on our own buildings or own land. Um, and um, you know, I, think, well, I think that's it. So, uh, so those, yeah, those are the things we've done so far uh, in addition to you know, fighting a pandemic and running elections and, and a lot of the other positive things we've done. And, and we're, we're looking forward to continuing this and making Bucks County a leader in this Commonwealth. So thank, thank you. you. That's, that's terrific. Commissioner DiGeralmo. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want a few comments on the vaccine. And uh, I know we had a good presentation today from Audrey and some of the, the numbers that are out there about, you know, we're close to maybe this week, 50% uh, of the residents here in Bucks County are gonna have it, at, at least their first dose. And I mean, I think that's, that's great news and we're making a lot of progress. Uh, uh, about 10 days ago, I lost a almost a lifelong friend to the coronavirus and he was 68 years old. So, I guess the message I want to get is that we can't let our guard down. Even though with these numbers about how many people are vaccinated, I mean, we can't let our guard down. It is important, even though you've been vaccinated, to continue to wear your mask. Uh, even though if you're in the like, you know, with, with the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, you're 90 plus percent immune from getting the virus. I mean, there, there's still a lot about this disease that we don't know. And a lot of the healthcare professionals believe, even though you will not get the virus, that you can catch it while you will not become infected, but continue to spread it to other people. So I think it's important to realize that you still have to wear your mask, even if you're vaccinated. And, uh, you know, I, I know, as Commissioner Harvey said on Friday, I think they're going to hopefully make a decision about whether to continue to use the, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, I'm certainly not a doctor or healthcare professional, but from, from what I know, it appears to me that it's still very, very, very safe. I can tell you truthfully that if I was not vaccinated and I had the chance to get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, I would not hesitate in being able to get it. So I hope we get some good news on the J&J &J vaccine on Friday. Uh, I think it was a good idea that the, uh, the federal government put a pause on the J&J &J until they could study this a little bit more and I know there's some issue with blood, blood clotting very rare. I think it was like six or seven people out of the almost eight million people that had received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine around the country. So I, I think we still have to be really, really careful. And just lastly, I would, I would encourage people to get vaccinated. Now, I, I know some people have medical reasons or religious reasons about why they don't want to get the vaccine. And I think those are legitimate and reasonable. But if you're hesitant for any reason about getting the vaccine, I, I, I just would encourage you that I think it's safe. Um, you're not only protecting yourself, but you're protecting other people in the community, your family, your friends. And the more people that get vaccinated, I mean, I think 
the sooner we're going to be able to get the going back to normal with our lives as much as possible. I don't think this is going to go away for for a while yet. I mean, they talk about herd immunity, and uh, you know, I think that that might be a long way off. But uh, I I would not be hesitant in getting the vaccine, and I know some people have concerns, but I think it's safe. It'll safeguard you, and it'll safeguard your family, your friends, your coworkers, and anybody else you come in contact with. Thank you. Thank you. That's very important. Is there any brief public comment on non-agenda items? Public, go ahead. You can come up. Just give us your name and township. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, my name's uh, George Price. I'm from Morrisville, Pennsylvania. And I'm here, uh, I came up today because of a, an item that was removed from the agenda, the consideration of Clearwater AI. And I just, it deeply disturbs me that that was even on the agenda. And um, the, a very troubling company, it's being sued by many states and municipalities, the ACLU and the face, facial recognition software is, um, and the information they've gathered done a lot illegally. They're being sued by Facebook and other big tech companies for uh, very, you know, questionable practices that they're involved with. And I just want to make sure that we're not going to bring that into our county. So I think, um, anyway, I'd like to know what your position and why, how that got on the agenda. So this is the first year we've had this contract. And this is the first year we've had this contract, and you know it was on the agenda because it was something that had been requested. We have pulled it off the agenda because we wanted to look at it a little bit further and get dig deep into it. So we appreciate you and everybody else who reached out to us to help make us aware that we needed to take another look at it. Great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I just in an additional little thing I'd like to say is I was very pleasantly surprised when I went to vote last November and found the paper paper trail uh, system. It made me really feel a lot more uh, confident in my voting. Thank and, you. Uh, so thank you very much for doing that. And uh, I appreciate um, uh, I've gotten my second shot. And uh, I appreciate the vaccines, the system you set up. One little thing I would say is the re uh, registering for it on the software on this website was kind of onerous. And I was never really contacted back. And I got a link from someone else to get it. but. So I don't, I think maybe some it's kind of been a national problem with the software with these vaccines. I guess they haven't had much experience trying to register people for two shots during a pandemic. And so um, hopefully we won't have to make it better for next time. But. <laughs> Thank you for uh, your, your compost presentation. That's awesome. Nicole is a, a farmer down at, uh, at our farm. So it's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there any other comments in the in the audience today? Okay, is there any online? Commissioner, um, uh, on, only one of the original commenters asked to have their comments about the same issue read, um, and so I could do that now. This comes from uh, Nicole Weirbrock, W-E-E-R-B-R-O-U-C-K. Um, she is from, um, I think it's in her original message, um, New Britain Township. Um, while, while I am relieved to see that it was removed from today's meeting, I am asking for Clearview AI to not be considered at all for any present or future use, as it is a threat to our residents' safety and privacy. If the intended goal is better communication with deaf people, using interpreters or even video relay services would be the best course of action, because those both incorporate people who are more familiar with the language and the culture. The FCC's VRS services might be helpful to look into, but the most important thing you can do is incorporate deaf people into these decisions, as they are the ones most impacted by decisions about assist assistive service services for deaf people. I'd like to reiterate, this technology has advanced faster than our ability to legislate it. Without legislation on a federal, state, and local level in the United States, Bucks County residents are all vulnerable to being exploited by this unregulated technology. Clearview AI is being sued by the ACLU as well as the states of New York, Vermont, California, and Illinois. New Jersey has banned its use, and over 70 organizations are asking the Department of Homeland Security to stop using Clearview AI. We should not entertain using a service that wants us to, to demolish our First and Fourth Amendment rights. The National Institute of Standards and Technology's 2019 federal study has confirmed that facial recognition software misidentifies 
the elderly, young uh, uh, women and people of color at rates higher than that of white men. Bucks County census data shows that 17.6% of residents are people of color, 19.2% are 65 or older, 20.2% uh, are under 18 years old, and 50.9% are women. Our more at risk populations are at higher risk of false matches and any associated legal troubles that follow. Please take using Clearview AI off the table entirely. Thank you again. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No. Seeing none, is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. Is there a second? second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. <laughs>